Hello again, everyone. Um, in this video, we're going to talk real quickly about routine activities theory. Uh, it's generally considered an opportunity perspective of why crime occurs or uh, actually why victimization occurs. It kind of looks at both elements. You can look at crime and victimization and try to limit that. So the topics for this video, we're going to talk just real quickly about some of the history that underlies the development of the theory. Uh, routine activities theory itself, the main propositions associated with it, and the idea of opportunity and how that uh, is an influence in crime and victimization. So, and we'll talk real quickly about the differences of macro and micro level, uh, as this theory can be tested at both levels, the macro level and the micro level. And we'll talk about some of the more recent advancements over the last 20, 30 years is the integration of uh, lifestyles, the lifestyles perspective, which is more of a victimization perspective, right? Uh, looking at the victims themselves. So the historical perspective leading up to the development of uh, routine activities theory, which is developed by, uh, you know, Cohen and Felsen in 1979 is when they published their article with this work. Um, it's in the post-World War II era when the economy and technology was advancing. The economy started doing very well. Working households, people were getting back to work. Uh, and um, opportunity structure was changing, right? Plastics were advancing. Televisions were becoming a normal household item. Telephones, televisions, refrigerators, all these big advancements at the time that were occurring. And things were becoming more compact, compact in radios. And they were easier to be picked up and lifted and, and, and taken away from areas. And they were of high value. Uh, and so the opportunity to commit criminal acts or different criminal acts or more types of victimization was allowed for, given the fact that goods were being coming smaller, faster, more expensive, and uh, easier to carry to some degree. So within that, Cohen and Felsen developed their uh, routine activities theory in 1979, and it's got three significant propositions associated with it, three big uh, conceptual focuses, three big areas. So they looked, they said when the motivated offender, so that could be anybody essentially, uh, one of the big limitations of this theory doesn't really get into motivation or explain the underlying why of what motivation is. It's just a assumed constant from what I can gather. Um, an exposure, uh, access to a suitable target. A suitable target could be, you know, your cell phone, your um, uh, anything, a vehicle, a television that can be picked up, a computer, a laptop, any of these things, and capable guardians. So capable guardians can be, um, you know, police. It can be formal mechanisms such as police or uh, an actor of the state or an informal mechanism like your parents or your teachers, your friends, anybody around, uh, you know, the, you know, just uh, um, people observing the public just in general or a video camera. Uh, could perhaps be a capable guardian as well. So what they theorize is when these three factors converge in time and space, then you'll have an increase or likelihood of crime or victimization, right? That's when it's most likely to occur. And a victimizing incident or a criminal incident is going to occur. When these three components converge in time and space, when you have motivated vendors combined with suitable targets and capable guardianship, a lack of capable guardianship, essentially, uh, then that increases the likelihood of crime from for occurring. Okay, so how that relates to the opportunity, the opportunity in and of itself. So if you leave your wallet, right? If you leave your wallet in a public restroom and, and nobody's around and you forget it's there, and you walk out of the restroom and it's an empty restroom and you forget it's there, um, anybody that walks in has the opportunity now to essentially take that wallet and keep it as theirs, right? It's found and victimize you and or become a criminal themselves, right? Especially because the opportunity exists. The opportunity, I doubt there's any cameras within it. There might not be anybody else watching or observing that incident from occurring. There's no really capable guardianship. And it's a suitable target is the fact that the wallet is sitting there on the sink or whatever. And, and um, the individual themselves is a motivated offender, potential motivated offender. So that increases the likelihood that they'll actually take the wallet, right? Um, and you can see that opportunity structure, how it allows for criminal acts in some 
some instances when it doesn't. So if you walk into a bank, generally it's highly guarded, right? Sometimes they'll have a security officer there, uh, and they'll have cameras there for sure. They might have the bulletproof plexiglass there standing behind. They have the bank vaults and all these different factors, these capable guardians, the theorized capable guardians, to uh, reduce that opportunity from victimization or criminal incident of occurring. So that's um, the opportunity structure in a nutshell. So changes to the opportunity structure to commit crime, really, that's what underlies the impetus uh, for this work. And it's a good article. It's an easy article to read through. And um, really what they initially tested was the changing uh, climate in the post-World War II era and, and at the aggregate level, at the national level. Really, Marcus uh, Felsen and, and Cohen did in, in 1979 with their initial work. And um, that's, these are the factors they talked about, the evolution of plastics, goods, and you know, TVs, telephones, at least different things. So really what they're looking at, what this type of perspective is looking at, somebody once said to me, it's like baking a cake, right? So if you're baking a cake, you have these different elements. You, know, you need to have flour, right? You need to have eggs. You got to have sugar. You got to have milk. You have to have butter. And you need to have these things come together in time and space. And put them in the oven at the right temperature, and then you'll have a cake, right? If you do any of these things wrong, or if you forget to put the eggs, then you won't have a cake. If if they have uh, a lack of um, you know suitable targets, then there might not be any victimization that occur. Okay, can't steal a bike if there's no bike there to be stolen in the first place. So um, that's kind of what they're looking at the, from an opportunity theory, uh, opportunity theory, uh, a routine activities theory. They're not necessarily concerned too much with the motivation. Some of the theories we discuss later on, uh, like the social learning theories, the general strain theories, and, and uh, the control theories. Those really are trying to tap into motivation and the why. And so. So there's various ways to explore uh, this theory and test it empirically in, in various types of ways. So there's macro level approaches. Macro level is just large scale, large groupings uh, at the, the whole American society, you know, any society, any, any country. You can look at it at the national level, neighborhoods or metropolitan areas, various cities across the country or any country. So these are macro level approaches. And this theory is also can be applied in the micro level, like individual level, right? So if somebody's being bullied, the, the routine activities theory, like hanging out on a bus or an individual parking lot, if there's lots of car thefts going on, that might be a micro level perspective, micro level approach, right? If you want to change the parking lot, you target hardening and all this literature that has come out about that, you know, put more lights in, put security cameras, have, you know, security guards on site, all these different factors can increase the capable guardianship to reduce the likelihood of that occurring, perhaps, right? According to this theory, essentially. So that's my a micro level approach. I've heard this theory referred to as a mid-level theory, a mid-level theory. So it kind of incorporates both. Uh, some might say neighborhoods, whatever a neighborhood is. That's a different argument for a different time. But anyways, that might be considered mid-level approach as well. So it's got micro level and macro level. Uh, macro level components that can be tested and, and assessed and there's a lot of different uh, empirical assessments of this theory and uh, it, it, it's a useful theory in explaining crime to some degree and victimization so on that note um, there have been advancements uh, over the years and the idea of lifestyles comes into play the idea of lifestyles theory it, it really looks at victimization specifically and says that an individual's lifestyle may be more conducive to being victimized, right? So if you're out, if you go to bars, right? If you're out at the bar at 2 a.m., uh, there's, there's a chance that you can be assaulted at that bar or get in a bar fight or something, all right? It might occur. Um, as opposed to somebody who doesn't ever go to the bar, that never goes to a bar, right? Their lifestyles are completely different. So they don't, they have zero opportunity being victimized if they never go to a bar, right? As opposed to somebody who does go to a bar and hangs out there all night, they have the chance. That's the opportunity exists. So the lifestyles, um, it gets touchy. Some people get into the idea of notion of victim blaming in the eighties and seventies. And, and it was a big critique on that type of issue, like victim blaming, you can't blame the victim and all that type of stuff. And yeah, that, 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 that's, that's sound, but, uh, there is the opportunity differs 
for individuals who play substances. So, so if you're selling drugs or doing drugs or out there involved in illicit activity, there's a good likelihood you might be robbed, um, uh, you know, assaulted or any type of thing uh, that might occur that comes to being a part involved in that type of lifestyle. I'm not saying it's right, wrong, good or bad. It's just part of the deal, right? So uh, that's when you start seeing lifestyles and routine activities theories trying to account for that, trying to account for that nuance, right? So if you ride a bus, if your kids ride the bus to school, um, there's an opportunity for them to be bullied on the bus, right? Um, as opposed to kids who never ride the bus or they walk to school or you take them there, you know, every day, every morning and pick them up every afternoon. Um, they have no opportunity to be um, victimized by bullying uh, just because they never ride a bus in that context. So the opportunity structure differs, right? So there's zero chances and there's true zeros. Uh, so just keep that stuff in mind. Uh, and and that, that is really an advancement within routine activities theory. And this theory is useful in explaining for crime and victimization and why it kind of occurs. Uh, and really accounting for contextual factors like baking a cake, right? So if you put enough eggs in, if you put enough sugar in, did they ride on a bus? Were they out there selling drugs? Were they, you know, hanging out with people who do drugs? Or were you driving while intoxicated? All these other factors, right? Um, and certain mechanisms and research out there really gets into target hardening and has a very applied response, a very a straightforward theory with a very applied response, right? We can change the opportunity structure and really perhaps reduce the type of victimization and criminal activity that occurs, okay? So just to recap, just briefly talked about the history underlying the theoretical development and why this came into play. It was looking at the opportunity structure in and of itself, how changes within the American society led to more, vi more opportunities for victimization to essentially occur. So talked about routine activity theory is the idea that when a motivated offender, a suitable target, and a lack of capable guardians converge in time and space, um, then you have the likelihood for crime or victimization to occur. So it really looks at the opportunity uh, uh, structure in and of itself. Uh, there's macro level and micro level tests of this theory. And, um, you know, it, it can be useful in that regard in, in, in that it can be applied and gives a real practical real world response. And that can be achieved fairly quickly uh, if uh, you know, efforts are directed adequately. And lifestyles, uh, the incorporation of lifestyles and routine activities theory is how you might see it. If you Google search it, you'll probably see a lot of research that has been involved with that. Uh, it really looks at the, the context of the individuals uh, and their lifestyles and really factors that into the equation, right? It accounts for that in the equation. So, all right, y'all have a good one, okay?